welcome to episode 2 of the Ted Coningsby series, Lost Airfields, and Ted and I are at RAF Harrington in Northamptonshire. RAF Harrington was built in September 1943 and it was the home of the famous 801st Bomb Group who took part in the famous Operation Carpetbagger. During the Cold War, Harrington was a Thor missile site designed to deliver atomic warheads to the Soviet Union. The original plans for RAF Harrington was to become a satellite for 84th Operational Training Unit, Royal Air Force at RAF Desborough. After the airfield's completion in the spring of 1944, the station's new intentions were intended for heavy bomber use and Harrington was allocated to the United States Army Air Force's 8th Air Force and was a designation station 179. The first to enter service of the United States Army Air Force were the 801st Bombardment Group who arrived from RAF Alconbury on the 25th of March 1944. The group were equipped with the consolidated B-24 Liberators and the group became known as the Carpetbaggers. The Carpetbagger missions were to fly B-24 Liberators with all armament removed with the exception of armament from the top or tail turrets and it was to drop supplies to enemy occupied countries to resistance groups in France, Denmark, Belgium, Norway and Holland. Most of the sorties were flown to support Patriots in northern France. Bomb shackles were removed from the bomb bay and pretty much every space in the Liberator was utilised to carefully fit as many supplies as possible with special supply canisters. Oxygen bottles, radio gear or anything that could be removed to fit more supplies were carried out. Also carpet bag emissions would involve delivery of personnel and agents to the field with the occasional return of some of the personnel from the field. The missions had to be done at night and at low level. The B-24s were not escorted by fighter aircraft, there were many losses. Special routes had to be chosen to avoid action from enemy aircraft. The aircraft would have to drop below 2,000 feet to avoid detection by radar and avoid potential enemy threat attacks. The takeoffs from Harrington were done carefully and although night missions were standard, the moon played a major part in the success for each mission. The moon had to be out, making the ground visible to the navigator and bombardier. When the drops were made, the pilots would drop to low level at anywhere between 300 to 600 feet, depending on what was being dropped, such as personnel. Speed had to also be reduced to not damage parachutes. The process for a carpet bagger mission would start off at the HQ of the OSS, now known as the CIA. Targets were plotted and planned at around 1700 hours the day before the mission, but on the next day, on the day of the mission at 0900 hours, the weather conditions would be carefully analysed and planned for a carpet bagger mission and to see if it would go ahead in the night. Two hours later, Squadron commanders are called, they meet and look at the maps in a group operations room. There are tabs pinpointing the targets for that night. Targets were assigned to squadrons with squadron leaders selecting targets. Any disagreements between squadrons were decided by a toss of a coin in some situations. Um, then 
there would be a series of briefings, meetings and of course loading the aircraft. The night missions lasted about 5 to 8 hours. In August 1944, the 801st Bombardment Group absorbed by the 492nd Bombardment Group Heavy. The 492nd was a hard luck B-24 group which had lost 52 aircraft to enemy action in only 89 days, suffering 588 men killed or missing. Rather than try to rebuild the shattered group, the group was stood down and the surviving members were reassigned to their other units in the theatre. The group seized carpetbagger missions on the 16th of September 1944. The 492nd returned to the clandestine carpetbagger operations over Germany and German-occupied territories using B-24 and A-26 and British Mosquito aircraft in March 1945 to drop leaflets demolition equipment and agents. The unit flew its last carpetbagger mission in April 1945. After the war, Harrington fell into disuse, but its fate was to be given new life for another sinister time. In 1955, the contract from the US government for the development of an IRBM, Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile System, went to the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, which by prodigious fates of engineering and design delivered the first SM-75 Thor missile in October 1936 and despite an inauspicious start in the test flight program the first four launches ended in failure. The system was declared operational though in 1959. The plan was to deploy the Thor missiles to Britain and a proposal was put forward in 1957 and was an even proposed that it would cost Britain nothing with the exception of funds needed to prepare the site preparations and building works. To avoid political complications, the weapons would be manned by the Royal Air Force, though the nuclear warheads would remain under the American control. The plan was to have 20 reformed Royal Air Force squadrons and operating three missiles each. After its number, each squadron would carry the initials SM, that strategic missile. Now, these are the only RAF squadrons ever to bear this designation. RAF Feltwell was the first to be designated as 77SM and was reformed at Feltwell on the 1st of September 1958. In 1959, Harrington was also chosen to become a Thor missile site, number 218SM. Now that Harrington was a Thor missile site, it was nearly involved in the world's first ever nuclear war. In 1962, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union placed missiles on the island of Cuba. In 1959, Castro had led the communists into Cuba and had taken control. The Soviet Union had promised to support the communists and defend Cuba with their Soviet weapons. Therefore, as part of the agreement, Soviet Premier Khrushchev installed nuclear missiles on Cuba. 
the USA had also installed missiles in Turkey. The USA cut off supplies to the island and demanded that missiles to be removed from Cuba. With Thor sites on standby, with the Soviet Union and the United States ready to press a button, this was the closest the world has ever come to nuclear war. President John F. Kennedy and Khrushchev exchanged messages and both agreed to stand down. The US would never invade Cuba and they would remove and the withdrawal of missiles that they had set out in Turkey. Khrushchev also removed the missiles from Cuba and both carried out their promises and nuclear war was avoided and the crisis was over by late November 1962. This is known as the Cuban crisis. The nuclear missile site of Harrington is now a protected as a grade two listed building as an example of Cold War architecture. So if you'd like to find out more, don't forget you can visit the Harrington Museum and the Carpetbagger Aviation Museum too. There's also a Thor exhibit as well. We'll put a link in the description so that you can find out more and to find out when the opening times are because they open and close at certain times of the year. Yeah, but I think one of the things that's right, 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 one of the things